Thank you. Thanks, guys. I appreciate, uh, really feel humbled to be part of this uh, panel, distinguished panel today. So uh, I was asked for talking about the management of delayed gastric emptying uh, today. Let's see if I can click through this. There we go. Let me go back one. There we go. Thanks. Um, I have nothing to disclose. It's sort of after putting this talk together, I thought I should look up which pharmaceutical company makes Reglan and erythromycin, but I'm not getting any from them. So today I just want to go through a little bit of definitions, the epidemiology of DGE, how to prevent it, how do we treat it, and then what do I do in my practice. So let's start with a little case scenario. So these are actually two patients in the past uh, three or four months that I just put together up here. And so patient number one is a 54-year-old male. He's undergoing a powerful preserving Whipple for a three centimeter neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreatic head. He has hypertension, he's a bit overweight with a BMI of 32, and, and a good nutritional status looking at his albumin of 4.6. Patient number two, 73 year old female. She's under, also getting a powerful preserving Whipple resection for a 2.8 centimeter pancreatic adenocarcinoma after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. She has hypertension, she has diabetes as well. Her BMI is lower at 25, her albumin is lower at 3.3. So, just be thinking about these two patients in the back of your head, which do you think is more likely to develop delayed gastric emptying compared to the other? And, and maybe you can't always predict. So similar in Michelle's talk, I think historically there was a lot of variability in terms of what studies talked about delayed gastric emptying, what was mild, moderate, severe. And so the same thing, the I, uh, ISGPS 2007 standardized the definition, and that's been really revolutionary so that we can study this going forward and actually compare data from study to study. And so they break it down into grade A, grade B, and grade C, delayed gastric emptying. And the differences refer to how long the NG tube is required or if it needs to be replaced at a certain post-operative day, as well as how long until those patients are available, are able to take solid intake. And you can break them down uh, in that way. So epidemiologically, the incidence for delayed gastric emptying is about 15 to 35 percent, depending on what study you look at. This is a meta-analysis that I'm going to refer to a little later in the talk uh, from 2017, and they looked at 52 studies and, and accumulated 11,000 patients who undergone Whipple, and the overall incidence in that was 27 percent. And now breaking it down by grade of fistula as grade A was about 18.5 percent, B and C's were lower. So if we talk about clinically relevant DGE, DGE, which is grades B and C, that's about 14% in this, uh, in this meta-analysis. So what's my takeaway from that, right? And this is all about the context. So incidence is not 100%. I had a surgeon that trained me in residency that for every Whipple gave every patient a G-tube and a J-tube because they felt like in their mind DGE was 100% and they could send them home with the G-tube to drain and feed them with the J-tube, but it's really not that high. And so I don't think we need to be that um, conservative in our management. Not everyone needs an NG-tube first any time, if at all. It definitely, DGE definitely does increase hospital costs and it affects oncologic outcomes. I was sort of interested when I read that. And so there was a, a paper from 2017 out of Japan that was specifically looking at the impact of delayed gastric emptying uh, on survival. And so they looked at 383 patients who underwent a Whipple resection over an eight-year study period. And just to break it down numbers-wise, epidemiologically, they had 63% did not develop any delayed gastric emptying, 37% did, and you can see the great uh, breakdown of A, B, and C types of DGE. And what this paper did was great because it actually looked at five-year survival data for these patients. So if you look Overall five-year survival on the top left there, patients who had no delayed gastric emptying had a 41% five-year survival. Those who had delayed gastric emptying in the post-operative period, their five-year survival was significantly lower at 32.7%, and even lower if they had grade C delayed gastric emptying at 27%. Even better than that, you know, as, as Michelle was talking about, sometimes we do Whipple in patients who don't have pancreatic cancer. So they actually looked at specifically patients with pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and if you compare that five-year survival, you also see the same drastic results. So patients without delayed gastric emptying, five-year survival is 16%. And those who developed delayed gastric emptying, it was only 8%, so about half. And patients with grade C, it was only 5%. And you can see it reflected in the Kaplan-Meier curve. So that was pretty impactful. And, and why? I don't think any of us know the why of that. The data is there, but perhaps it's because they have a longer recovery. They have a weakened immune response because of that longer recovery. Perhaps there's delays to getting to adjuvant therapy, or maybe they don't develop adjuvant therapy at all because they had such a rough post-operative course. So I don't think we have answers to that quite, quite yet. So how do we prevent it? 
I wish I had the answer to that. And so I looked at uh, this paper I want to look at first from 2017, that same international study group um, looked at a meta-analysis comparing those patients. And what I liked about it is they took different surgical techniques step by step and compared the literature on it. So just to go through a couple bullet points, if we compared standard whip section from pylorus preservation, what's the data out there? It's really mixed. There were some that show higher delayed gastric emptying with pylor preservation, some that show no change. Really wasn't enough to make a strong statement one way or another. How about pyloric preservation versus pyloric preservation with pyloric dilation? And so that is where you do a pyloric for Whipple, but prior to completing your duodenogenostomy and estimosis, you use a hemostat or a curve six and really stretch that pylorus open, almost a little pyloroplasty. And you get the benefits of preserving the innervation of the antrum, you preserve the gastric pacemakers of the antrum, and you really minimize the narrowing or spasm of the pylorus. And they identified four articles, and they all showed clinically significant lower rates of delayed gastric emptying in patients who had the pylorus preserving with pyloric dilation. What about the type of reconstruction? Billroth 1, Billroth 2, or Ruin Y really showed that Billroth 2 is superior. You know, making a rulum up there, I think possibly with the motility doesn't help. And again, four, uh, four large studies, three retrospective, one randomized control trial, that all showed that. How about bringing your jejunum up, and making it anticholic, making it retrocholic? Again, really showed some mixed results, but if you can see in the table here, I'm not sure how it projected, there are definitely several studies that show a clinically significant low p-value showing that probably anticholic maybe is better than retrocholic. We'll talk about that in a minute, and one of the thoughts is that perhaps you're keeping that anastomosis farther away from your pancreatic anastomosis. So now that we've confused you in terms of how we prevent it, how do we treat it when we develop it? And this is a complication, and it's really an annoying complication. It's not always life-threatening, but it's really annoying for, I think, for patients and their families. I think an important thing we need to differentiate is primary delayed gastric emptying versus secondary. And I'll talk about secondary first, and secondary delayed gastric emptying is actually more common, and that's delayed gastric emptying when it's related to an other intra-abdominal etiology, so a pancreatic leak or intra-abdominal abscess, for example. Primary DGE is when you don't find any other under underlying etiology. It's simply just the stomach is asleep. And so when we see delayed gastric emptying in our practice, I think I'm pretty aggressive about getting cross-sectional imaging to rule out any intra-abdominal source. Is there a, a pancreatic leak that we're missing that perhaps our surgical drain is not catching? Are there IR drains that need to be placed because of that? And then after we've really ruled out whether it's primary or secondary, then that's when we move to prokinetic agents. Typically, first line is Reglan, just because it's uh, cheaper and more available. And then erythromycin um, base, at least in our institution, we have to get through, uh, uh, go through our pharmacist to get approval to get in. And I think the, the one important point that's important in these patients is you don't want to get behind the nutritional status. Oftentimes, these patients are already malnourished, especially if we're operating for pancreatic cancer, and now we're delaying it. And so I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I try not to delay starting parental nutrition. I don't always leave a J2, but if there is a J2 place, then entral is obviously better. But you don't want to get behind that. And then the last thing I'd say for treatment is patience. Patience for you as a surgeon, patience for the family and the patient that this will resolve. It needs some time. We don't need to go and usually do anything too crazy early on in terms of leaving a time to resolve. So the last statement I want to leave you with is this um, from the, uh, this seminal article on the ERAS recommendations for pancreatic surgery. Dr. Asman is going to be talking next, actually one of the authors on this. And in the section on delayed gastric emptying, uh, this statement was made, and I think it sums it up. There are no acknowledged strategies to prevent delayed gastric emptying, although a timely diagnosis and treatment of intra-abdominal complications might reduce the duration of delayed gastric emptying. So that's something that I really take home. So if we look back again at our two patients that we've been through in the beginning, patient one and patient two, with a show of hands, who thinks patient one with a three centimeter nodercon tumor is more likely to develop delayed gastric emptying? And how about patient two? Who thinks that that patient with the older patient, poor nutrition, you had chemotherapy? All right. Oh, these are two real patients. The patient one had pretty nasty delayed gastric emptying. Uh, that, that took a while to resolve. He got better, but uh, in this situation, and, and it was because he developed a pancreatic leak and required an IR drain and, and had a prolonged course from that. Easier to do a whipple on a EMA of 25, they all take that patient over <laughs> 35 <laughs> any minute. <laughs> so just in summary, what we did is we talked about the, de the definitions of the laser gastric emptying as, as laid out by the ISGPS, epidemiology, how do we prevent it? The data is not really clear on there. There's some ideas that we do. 
um, how do we treat it? And so the important take home point is really to make sure you find any intra-abdominal pathology. And what do I do besides looking for intra-abdominal pathology, treating with Reglan and erythromycin? The last thing is really reassurance in patients um, and, and not feel like you need to do something more and it will resolve as long as you're not missing any other complications. Thank you.